Good evening. Welcome to Chain Reaction. My name's Aid Edmondson, and tonight I'm interviewing one of the funniest women in Britain. I say one of the funniest because, of course, my wife is the funniest woman. <laughs> uh, and I'm under strict instructions to make that clear from the outset. But running a very close second, or third if you count Dawn French, <laughs> it's Ruby Wax. I'm happy to be there. Happy to bring up the rears. Are you? Yeah. I've never asked anyone questions before. I know. So I'm a bit nervous. Oh, God. Do I look like Parkinson? (laughs) I've got a clipboard and everything. Could you just try to look interested? This is my first question, because I am interested. When you left school, you went and did um, a psychology degree at Berkeley. And just recently, you finished an MA in neuroscience. Well, not an MA yet, but yeah. Well, yeah. But these two things... How do you count for the blip in the middle? Oh, okay. Um, I thought I'd combine the psychology with drama because there was something called psychodrama. So I came to England and just went to drama school. To do psychodrama? Yeah, I thought I would go back. I never realised that. Yeah, I wasn't going to... I thought you'd just come here to be a dramatic actress. I think I tell people that, but I didn't think there was much chance (laughs) of that. But then my, um, you know, my drive took over. You know, yeah. like a Rottweiler. And I decided, yeah. yes, I would become a classical actress based on nothing. Yeah. You know, in drama school where you don't get any parts, it's not a good sign. And you're paying. I can't imagine you did that. Did you do the whole three years there? The whole three years. Did you? Yeah. In Going, Glasgow. Ta, 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 la, 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 ta. That's the only place that would take me. <laughs> three years in Glasgow, that's quite commitment. <laughs> Nobody would take me. Yeah. Um, I tried in England. I auditioned for Rada four times. And when they didn't call my name, I said, there must be some mistake. <laughs> and they said, no, there's no mistake. <laughs> You're just, um, yeah. And why, why did you come to Britain to do it? I Wasn't couldn't get a... in anywhere in America. <laughs> but that's not funny. I tried all over America. Not one place. So the only place in the world prepared was Glasgow to train because nobody wanted to live there. It was in total dark. It was like an ashtray with some stoplights. It was <laughs> now it's beautiful, but nobody wanted to go to Glasgow. So yeah. they were happy so to see some places. money coming. And your dad was quite happy to pay for that. Was he? Well, it was cheaper than an insane asylum, and I'm not joking. They always thought I'd be institutionalized, yeah. and Glasgow back then was three hundred dollars in a, a year. Yeah. And it was so bad that, this is true, Jerry, the least talented person outside of seaweed, came on. You, you could do audition pieces. His name is now Ian McKellen. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry was so stupid that um, you got, like, you know how you get a choice of what to do as your drama piece. So it yeah. said, to be or not to be, dot, 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 with a bear bodkin. He did that. He said, to be or not to be, and then with a bear bodkin, and took a bow and went off. He thought... <laughs> He didn't know the dot, dot, dots meant yeah. you fill in some. That's how bad it was, and he got in. But, ne- but nevertheless, once, once you'd been there and given up psychodrama, you got into the RSC. Yeah. So you, must have, had, you must have had some talent. None at all. <laughs> but what, I mean, who, who, who did the audition? I, I did the audition. No, but who... <laughs> What I, meant, what I meant was who took the audition. Oh, right. Who were you auditioning for? Uh, Trevor Nunn right. and John Barton. Were and they there. thought you had it. I make a joke at my show, you know, because I, I had done my tongue exercises for three years and I think Trevor Nunn really liked what I could do with my tongue. <laughs> but that's not true. I had learned to do these audition pieces. And, uh, and then I, I just knew it was now my big break to never go back to Chicago again. You know, I needed to run away, and I need to run away bad, so I made myself good, just of sheer determination. But you ran away to something you liked, though, didn't you? Did I like it? Did you not like it? I liked it more than... I mean, it seems to me, because I know, you know, people like Alan Rickman and and Zoe Wanamaker and Juliet Simpson, they're still your friends now, so that kind of group you had then formed a kind of basis of friendship for your life, didn't it? So there there must have been something deeply good about that period. Uh, No, it wasn't. When I was playing, literally, again, seaweed and a nun, with no lines, uh, those people weren't so nice to me. (laughs) Were they not? No. Uh -uh. I used to try to befriend Zoe. I never knew this. She would not invite me over, and I'd say, well, I'm free. Seriously. Rickman, of course, had to live with me and uh, learned to love that. Why did he have to live with you? Because we were the last two left or something, so we Uh moved into a house uh, which we named... it was a law or something. (laughs) (laughs) He knew me from before. So we moved into Shakespeare's sauna, we used to call it, and had Betty, my tortoise, 
um, was our child. It's a long yeah. story. <laughs> Um, anyway, Rickman started to nurture me. He said, why don't you write the way you speak? He said it was like somebody had vomited on his lap and then he had to make sense of it. Yeah. So I started writing comedy and I cast all the famous people in it as my servants. Yeah. And, and when then, you, you did that, where did you do that? First it started off in somebody's bedroom. Yeah. Um, Darlene Johnson's bedroom. So we called it the Johnson Wax Floor Show and we made Trevor Nunn and everybody come. And we had no curtain, it was her bedroom, so we'd go out with a sheet and then drop it and then begin. <laughs> and charged everybody money for our playbill, <laughs> which wasn't a playbill at all, it was a thing you get at the dry cleaner. <laughs> it says how much your clothes cost. Yeah. But we charged everybody money for it. And then we did our show. But the Johnson Wax Floor Show, because yeah, that, that's when I first knew you, because you came uh, to see Rick and myself at the Woolwich Tram Shed, and you came to see us afterwards. This is not a good story for you. No, I uh, <laughs> You I came to see us I afterwards know. and um, said, I really like what you're doing. Why don't you come to my flat on Saturday and we'll, we'll, we'll work out some stuff to, to put in this sh- new show I've got. And uh, I was the first to turn up, and you opened the door and said... Oh, not you, the other one. <laughs> <laughs> but you, never, I... <laughs> you, never, you waited until people were watching to say that to me. It's the only reason I'm here, Rube. <laughs> <laughs> you waited all these years just to get me back, just to stab me in the heart. Now, now switching countries is quite extreme, is it? No, not when you're 18. Uh, my <laughs> parents were immigrants, and they had to flee. So it was in my blood to flee back, in case they dropped something on the way yeah. over. But you didn't run back to Austria, did you? Well, I wouldn't have gone back to Austria. Yeah. But um, I, I needed to run away from home because yeah. it was too horrible. So I hitchhiked um, to Euro- through Europe, um, hoping something would happen. But generally, most people that sort of um, move countries kind of move back at some point. They've, they think of, of where they've come... I have, we don't have that home. sentimentality. You don't? I know. It's it, amazing. Immigrants, we don't think, yeah, that's where they exterminated no, us. No, I Let's think it's... <laughs> we don't have that. Like no, I, Irish I'm talking about... Go, I uh, love the soil. I'm talking about you in America. <laughs> yeah. Most, most people, most Americans over here so kind of think of America as home still. They still kind of wait up on the 4th of July to watch yeah. whatever it is that happens. Um, <laughs> but you, 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 you retain nothing American. This is weird, because everyone thinks of you as a kind of brash, loud-mouthed American. I don't think they but do. I, uh, well, <laughs> I, don't think I think they do. They do. <laughs> They're no, laughing well, at well, you, because they think, where's he getting that? <laughs> but what, the point I'm trying to get to is that I don't think you are American at all. It's weird. You've got a kind of American Voice. act. Yeah. But you've done some stuff in America, some of your documentaries in America, but then you weren't really known in America. But have you ever done anything in America that, that you kind of you thought was you? No, nothing works for me in America. I mean, because you had that time where you went back to, to write kind of sitcoms for people. Mm-hmm. What, what happened then? Cause you nothing. Didn't like it's, it, did you? You, know, it's, you know how, like, when you get lettuce from France, it loses something on the way over? Yeah. Everything I touch in America um, goes toxic. Ev- everything. <laughs> I can do, a, you know, the, the same documentaries with an American crew, and it's a failure. Because nobody gets the irony. They go, why are you being so rude to them? And eventually you're worn down. You lose your tenacity. It, and it fails. It, it, my shows were three times on television, and they had to pull them off early. Because yeah. people were so upset. <laughs> but actually, you're really good at, at presenting America to, to, to English people. Yeah, because I, I have such a resentment. Yeah. <laughs> That, you know, I, I have a smile, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sticking the nails in for yeah. what they used to do to me. It's revenge. Well, the Miami memoirs in particular was about your parents, oh. wasn't it? So Whoa, was that a... That was, that was real kick in the ass for giving me hell for 20 years. Yeah. You know, making me go to the beach, and that was all true. My mother dressing me up in the bathrobe, terry cloth bathrobe that you got free at the bank, and then saying, <laughs> go down the beach, make friends, Ruby, make friends. <laughs> And I'm, like, 16, and people aren't talking to me, and, oh, it was horrible. You once told me that your dad um, used to drive you to school in a, a, in a car that was shaped like a giant wiener. <laughs> and, you, and you know that's true, because you've seen the pictures. Yeah, but I always thought when you told me that story, it's just a little bit cool. <laughs> I was a bit jealous. I would like to have been yeah. driven around in a sausage. When you're 20. <laughs> it would be cool then, but when yeah. you're 13, <clears throat> yeah. and you're being, cur- you know, uh, uh, there's a big sausage following you, it, you do not... <laughs> You do not make the cheerleading team. <laughs> you are a mockery. 
Well, that, it's a weird kind of sort of um, yin and yang here in your parents, isn't it? They, I mean, I think the kind of, it's well documented the kind of uh, the hurt you went through. Do you think the being as funny as you are is, is a kind of product of that? And do you think you would you rather have had a, a sane childhood? Well, I always, not be funny. this is interesting that I say, what do you call Jennifer Saunders, you know? Yeah. She's much more brilliant than I'll ever even dream of. <laughs> yes, she is. <laughs> <laughs> I think I said I, that I, in my intro. I, I know, but um, I didn't hear anybody go, no, she's not. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, I wanted to inside, but I know she'd didn't, hurt me. Yeah, <laughs> she'd kill you. Uh, so uh, she had a perfectly normal background, so how can you say you have to, you know, have, yeah. you have to have, have insanity as mommy and daddy, or as we called them, the Scud missiles, <laughs> um, to launch you into being funny. But there's a there's a lot of your really fantastically best material. I think, you know, the the, the one woman shows are my favourite things, and they're so funny because they're so true. And what happened was really quite extraordinary. And it, but you, so for some weird reason, you kind of owe them for your com- comic material. Yeah. How do, you, how do you kind of resolve that in your head? Uh, well, I dig them up and go, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember... <laughs> but I remember when, before your parents sort of went a bit senile... Those they, were the good days. And they, <laughs> you, you used to bring them round. You used to bring them to England, and then you'd invite us all round to look at them. I know. Yeah, I did. <laughs> like a kind of freak show. And they they, they'd never quite do the material we wanted them to well, do. They were a constant disappointment. And I rehearsed them, I rehearsed Did them. You? At the RSC, when they used to come, there was standing room only. They'd like the, nobody was on stage. They were all sitting around on my, at my house waiting for my mother to crawl in on all fours with four sponges connected to her straight from the airport. And they just watched the greatest one-woman show ever, chasing a crumb across a room in front of people. Saying, civilized people don't bring sand in a building. <laughs> tell me, the, there's one story, I don't know if, if you've told it very often, but I'd like you to tell it, the one about Michael Horden and your dad. Oh, um, I was playing a wench, which I was, I was spectacular as a wench. I took my I st- stomach and I pulled, pushed it up and then made a cleavage. <laughs> And wore my underpants on my head and, and spoke that kind of early porno. Yeah. Oh, no, couldn't <laughs> um, And so I played wenches really well. So um, uh, Michael Horton was playing my boyfriend in Love's Labor's Lost. And then afterwards, we all went to the duck, you know, where everybody yeah. ate. And my dad said, oh, well, you're all Ruby's friends. I'll pay for you, like with patronizing. And they went, no, no, Mr. Wax, you don't have to. And he went, no, come on. Fellas, it's on me. Listen, when you get famous, <laughs> you can pay for me. And my, Michael Horton tapped at my dad's shoulders and he went, but I am. And my, and my dad slapped him and said, oh, come on, old man. <laughs> it's a tragedy. And gave him, I think, a fiver. Writing. So after the Not the Night News, which I never knew you'd written. Um, they don't even know. <laughs> did, That's how did long ago paid? it is. You I had went a off and, you wrote... and a feather, and I wrote a scroll for Pamela Stevenson, you, who looks uh... worse than I do, so that's good. <laughs> no, sorry. There is a god uh. of moisturizer. You've never sort of been a writer, writer, except for yourself. I mean, you've done well, uh, of... Jennifer's stuff is, is, you know, that's my idea of a good time. You know, yeah. she flips me the perfect tennis ball. So it's really fun to hit it back. People say, would you write for me? But nobody can top Jennifer. It's yeah. not, it wouldn't be fun. You'd just be erasing stuff. What, you mean script editing other people's stuff? I couldn't. Nobody's that good. I can't find anybody who writes like can that. Can you explain how it works? Jennifer gets possessed by the devil. Like, usually she's just heading roses. Is that... Yeah. yeah. Or Dead shoveling muck. Yeah. yeah. She likes those things. Shoveling. And then the show is the next day, and people are calling her, saying, we have to build a set. And that doesn't bother her. She goes on cleaning yeah. and reading magazines. Um, and then somewhere around 2 o'clock in the walk. morning, yeah. I'm imagining it's like uh, devil <clears throat> possession. Something enters her. And she starts to write a perfect script. And about 5 o'clock in the morning, she'll send me a line and I'll go, no, no, like this. And so we start to, it's like a sculptor, you know, until we know it's the perfect line because Jennifer starts doing that laugh. 
yeah. that I, then I know to go on to the next. We're, we're all kind of aware that your lines are the killer lines. In no, it. they're but not. They're, they're kind of hung on a really good... Yeah, they got a good skeleton, aren't they? Yeah. I'll just push it further and further, yeah. you know, until she goes, that's now too much. Like, you know, <laughs> menopause, when we had the menopause workshop, I said, embrace the dryness. <laughs> <laughs> And she said, um, that's I think enough. that got through, didn't it? That got through. Yeah. How do you not write other stuff? You write your own one-woman shows. You, you write Jennifer's kind of funny lines. Yeah. I wrote that book that was really dark. You know, how do you want me? Yeah. I write articles, you know, when yeah. they send me to Bhutan or Maldives, I write really well. <laughs> so, um, you know what I mean? Yeah. Why would I write for any other reason? I wondered why you'd never written a... Because, I mean, you, you wrote bits of Girls on Top of them. I mean, that was a three, yeah. three of you writing, wasn't it? I wonder why you'd never written your own kind of sitcom. I, I, it doesn't work. I need Jennifer. You know, if there's a blank piece of paper, it stays blank. Yeah. But once somebody starts dribbling some ink, then I know what to do. So that's why I never wrote it. Yeah. Also, it's too late for a sitcom. Right. I can't play cute anymore, even though I am. <laughs> <laughs> now... The one woman shows are what really kill me in terms of your talent. Stand-up comedy. Your stuff is, I think, better because... Because I only do it once every ten years. Well, <laughs> So I got a lot of material. That. It's a moving target. But um, because it's so kind of truthful and accurate. In fact, yours isn't comedy at all. Most people go on about, imagine if elephants took over the world. And it's all kind of surreal kind of nonsense and jokes. Well, you don't have any jokes at all, and yet it's the funniest stuff I've ever seen. How do you get the balls to kind of Put it down. tell the truth about it? <laughs> yourself and everyone around you? I can't I mean, lie. I've seen Ed at the back, your husband at the wincing. back of stuff. Not wincing, because I think he's you know, very proud of it all, but it, it's bits where you think, oh, poor Ed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, I can't lie. You know, like yeah. I can't even change anybody's name. Yeah. You know, I'll, I have to say, you know, I told Ed, you were there halfway down the aisle. You remember when I got yeah. married, I told him how old I really was. Yeah. <laughs> and he tried to run, but, you know, where could he go? I think he did stumble. <laughs> yeah. Then I told him I was married twice before. That, that almost threw him. But wait till the last minute. It's I very funny, say. your wedding, because... You, you kind of sniggered the whole way through it, as I remember. Well, the woman looked like a chipmunk, yeah. so that killed me. <laughs> and then I had the receipt, receipt on, on as, as a ring. ring yeah. Remember, I didn't yeah. have the ring yet, but I was wearing yeah. the receipt. <laughs> but when you, when you sit down to write a show, like the new one, Live at the Priory... Which is well, the... yeah, it's, it, it's Live at the Priory, but now it's coming to the West End as, as losing it, yeah. It's basically a, a kind of... Um, history of your depression. Well, it, I'm not talking about depression. It happens toward the end. L- the one losing it now. The, we don't the one mention, I saw. <laughs> yeah. Well, you saw it from the Priory. You yeah. know, you have to have something in common with your audience. Yeah. You know. I was there um, as a guest. <laughs> we had my uh, my opening was at the Priory, and you had my selected friends mixed with residents of the Priory, and everybody was going, "Who's oh, crazy?" <laughs> <laughs> So it was a really good mixture. Um, but now the show isn't called... It, now it's called Losing It, and it's for the public, who clearly aren't the one in four, yeah. who are nuts. And um, so it's not about depression. I wanted to make a show about where we are now, you know, about none of us got a manual as to how to live our life. Like, I, who knew how to be a mother? Who knows how to get old? Nobody knows anything. So the, the show is about being lost all the time. And that's eventually why you lose it. Not yeah. because you have, you know, something wrong with your chemicals. Is that true? In my case, it is. <laughs> I mean, if you had a hardcore schizophrenia, he's not doing the show. Yeah. <laughs> but when you... There's a lot of stuff, I imagine, still in losing it. There's a lot of stuff about you and your particular kind of slide. Yeah. I yeah. get the feeling that most of your work is, is about kind of looking for some kind of enlightenment's a word. Yeah. Um, and you, you did that a lot in the early stuff with those kind of... I took the freak piss out shows. of them. Yeah. You kind of did freak did, Even the big sort of Madonna and the Pamela Anderson things, those are kind of freak shows in their own way, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, they're freak Try, shows. Trying to look for the... Trying to find what it is about humans by finding the ones who really don't work. <laughs> <laughs> O.J. Simpson with his banana. Yeah. No, well, that's more interesting than the ones that do work. But I sense a kind of change in your kind of thinking there. When, when you see the stuff you do on the, um, on the internet of the headroom uh, psychotherapy stuff, can you explain what the headroom campaign is? No. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, it was for it was a great idea. It was uh, it, it's a BBC website. You go on, and each week, I kind of like that. A person with a different pathology would come to my house. So I'd open the door, and there'd be a schizophrenic or somebody with ADHD or um, uh, OCD. It was great because the cleaning woman thought, "What the hell is going on here?" <laughs> and the OCD cleaned the house. <laughs> I make them tea, and um, and they, you know, and we talk about their stuff, and they don't feel embarrassed because I've got it too. So it's like two animals at the watering hole, you know, really having a good time. I'm not patronizing, and so I think it's healthy for people out there who are ill to a see somebody else who's describing them. Then you're yeah. not so alone, and also who to call, what drugs, you know, all that kind of stuff. That was never available. Yeah. Uh, I think when I was doing all those celebrities that, that kind of poisoned me a little bit I used to do, I thought, interesting documentaries and I was engaged yeah. once I got with too many celebrities it's like you're eating too much chocolate they started to make me sick because they all have the same issue you know. Yeah. Uh, first of all, looking around rooms to see who's looking and getting angry and then who's not looking and getting, you know, the yeah. same old crap I had to look at Sharon Stone's knee to see how it was aging um, <laughs> so I started to feel like a whore you know because, you know, I had to smile and keep it going, and I wanted to go, I don't find you interesting at all. You know, some of them were, but um, I couldn't fake it anymore, you know, of, of talking on that surface stuff. Well, you, you sort of became a, as big as the celebrities you were interviewing, which became a problem, really. Well, because it? I was, a, you know, all this stuff came out. You got out. kind of as wide as they were, therefore there was a kind I of... I got polluted by it, totally. I, yeah. I got into that celebrity thing where you start looking who's looking. Yeah. You know, I didn't realize that it creeps up on you like when you, you know, do coke for a few times and it's fun and the next thing you know is I you're going, I would have no idea. Please give me more. <laughs> no, I'm just using that as a metaphor. <laughs> but it, it is an illness. But uh, what, was, what was the worst you got to as, as a celeb? As a celeb? Oh, here's the one. When I was, I used to get upgraded, you know, just pure things going, I'm here. You and didn't they, used to get upgraded. You used to fight for it. I, I've seen you. Yeah, you I'd always, fight for it. Always, yeah. You were never happy with what everyone else had. You no, had but if there was a one. gay steward, you bet your life, I'd turn <laughs> left. If it was a straight guy, he'd say, get in the rear. <laughs> but, so from America, I'd say, and I'll be upgraded or whatever. And the person said, and who are you? And I was so indignant. That's when you know you've lost yeah. it, when you... Suddenly, like a blowfish, my nostrils flared, and I went. I wanted to say I worked in media, but it didn't come out right, so I said, I'll have you know, I work in a public field. (laughs) (laughs) But that's when I knew I was insane. Did it work? No. No, they put me under the wheels like a piece of chewing gum. Yeah, I caught, I caught the disease, and then when TV starts to uh, spit you out, it is like getting your hit back of heroin. You know, go, give me more. Please, I'll play a corpse. Yeah. I'd li- I, you start pitching for shows, you know, where you make ashtrays out of, you know, your children's skin. <laughs> Anything just to get back on TV, you know, and, and then you really start to give away what it was that made you. And eventually, I thought, uh, man, i got to get my brain back. So that's when I thought, study neuroscience, because now you'll yeah. know how it works. And I'd rather die doing that than be in well, panto. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Which done, I've done. You've done both. <laughs> You're the kind of first to do those gonzo documentaries. And the kind of big ones that you did then were, were kind of... I mean, I watched about like 50 million people. It's extraordinary, isn't it? It's, it's a lot of people. Well, they used to only have a few channels. That's true. <laughs> now they kind of You're doing them. yourself down. But um, your, your kind of role has been taken over by a lot of people. And don't think it didn't kill me. Yeah. You know, any time. Who do you hate the most? I hate Louis Theroux. If, yeah. you say, if you people go, oh yeah, have you seen Louis Theroux? If I could tell you what it does to my body, yeah. I actually my whole system hurls back. Of course, I keep my smile on my face. My head whiplashes. The throw up is here, and I have to lower my cortisol by professional and drugs. <laughs> and I say, yeah, I think it's a great show. <laughs> No, it kills me, because yeah. nobody wants to be replaced. But, of course, that's life. You know, the next... I remember when we were the young... Tips. I remember when we were... Do you know, and you looked at the these things. guys in Dickie Birds and said, Yeah, I'm cool. Yeah. I'm alternative. And now look at us. <laughs> well, it's weird, isn't it? People think in the kind of business that we do that it, it, everything naturally flows. Everything goes from one thing to another. But really, it's just a constant struggle, isn't it? It's, it's always an audition. It's, it's a fight. And know? it's humiliating, you know, so that's why I decided to study science. Yeah. Because they can't take that away from me. Yeah. And it's quite a long period of work. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't end. I can't get fired. Yeah. <laughs> 
there's a kind of thing that happens in, in, in uh, people's lives where, they, where, they, where you flip and they have to do something else. I get, I get, if once this, this is your next show in the life of the Priory or losing it, is, is going to be, you've got to wait 10 years and get 10 years of material to build up the next yeah. stuff. What will that be based on? You mean in the next 10 years? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like saying, people used to say, what are your questions um, if you interviewed Obama or whatever? And, yeah. and I say, I know everything, but I have to wait till I see the whites of their eyes. You know, it, otherwise, it didn't come out of me. I, yeah. I can't predict. I didn't know I would be writing like this, with the knowledge of knowing how it all ticks around inside. Not that I talk about that, but when you do know how it works, it gets really interesting. And that's, every, that's everybody's dream, I think, is not, you know, yeah. if you're smart enough to know why the stars exist, but to know how your brain works. It's fantastic. It's more exciting than going to the boot of your car. <laughs> <laughs> but similar. <laughs> I just wanted to say, I, I'd, um, <clears throat> this is a surprise for you. Um, My mother's here? Yeah. <laughs> we dug her up and wrapped her in very nice polythene. <laughs> <laughs> it's like she used to have on the sofas. <laughs> but on your, uh, on your agent's website... <laughs> you know, I, I might pitch that at the BBC tomorrow. <laughs> on your agent's website, there's a page on you and it has at the bottom, well, it says everything you've done, all that sort of normal rubbish, and then it, then it, says, <laughs> it says skills. And along with the with sort of horse riding hands, things like that, it says accents, and it lists 22. <laughs> Get lists out of here. 22 accents you, you, you are capable of doing in a feature movie. Um, and I wonder if you could give us a bit of some of that. <laughs> You are classically trained. Um, so could you give us a bit of Bristol? <laughs> Birmingham? No. Nope. And my favourite, Caribbean. <laughs> does it say I do that? It does say that. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the greatest classically trained gonzo journalist, one-woman whirlwind of comedy and psychotherapy, not forgetting celebrity shark bait, Ruby Wax. <laughs> oh, yeah.